it took all my energy not to put on uh slip and fallen by dmx as our start song so pray for me that i don't suddenly decide to do that in the middle of the program Good morning and welcome to 100 Days of People's Town Hall for Justice. My name is Andres Jimenez, Executive Director at Green 2.0. Today, Green 2.0 is excited to partner with Tamara Tolls, O'Loughlin, the U.S. Climate Action Network, and the National Black Environmental Justice Network to bring you this town hall that allows for frontline leaders to have meaningful conversations with the Biden administration and with one another. Before I get started, I want to give you the run of show for today. Congressman Donald McEachin from Virginia will provide opening remarks. Next, there will be a panel with community leaders moderated by Tamara Tolls O'Loughlin, followed by a 15 minute break for questions and for an opportunity to stretch your legs. We will then move to the second half of our event with Mustafa Ali leading an interactive town hall between community leaders and the Biden administration. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A box and during the break, we'll address them in order. We also want to note that we know there are many important issues to be addressed on environmental justice, but here today we will be centering the conversation on climate, energy, agriculture, and transportation. 
Let me add that for far too long, decisions about environmental practices were made in communities of color that ultimately have long-term consequences. Rarely, if ever, were people in those communities brought in to help decide and implement those decisions. Diversifying the environmental movement during a time when the administration has pledged 40% of climate action plan to frontline communities is vital. With this plan measuring benefits over funding, it requires for the administration to work directly with diverse environmental organizations. Today, the air is more polluted, the water is dirtier, and these communities bear the harsh repercussions of neglect. The oil and gas industry dumps 9 million tons of methane and toxic pollutants into the air each year, disproportionately impacting the health of these communities. If anyone can address these issues, it's the people that live it. These are the people that should have positions at all levels of environmental organizations and government. People of color care about the environment, but their expertise and knowledge often aren't tapped into. We're seeing progress in the movement, but there's still a long way to go. As the movement grows and climate action increases, we must continue to hold people accountable to do the right, to do right by marginalized communities and the people who live them. We are also so appreciative that so many members of the Biden administration have joined us today to have a thoughtful conversation around the road ahead. Thank you all for being here. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to take a moment to thank the team at Green 2.0, Paige Knappenberger at Climate Nexus, Ishmael Buckner at the US Climate Action Network, Tina Johnson with the National Black Environmental Network, and a very, and a very big special thank you to Tamara Tolls Laughlin, whose vision and leadership made this event come to life. Thank you for giving me a call tomorrow. This amazing idea to bring the community and administration together to talk about these critical issues. This event is happening because of you. Okay, now let's get to it. Today, I have the honor of introducing Congressman Donald McEachin. Congressman McEachin is a champion for environmental justice and uses his role on the Natural Resource Committee in Congress to push forward an agenda that brings equality to all. Th through implementing policy and demanding accountability from all stakeholders, he understands why it is paramount that people of color impacted by environmental malpractice lead decision-making in their communities. Welcome Congressman McEachin and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, and thank you for that kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here with so many friends, leaders, and allies of the movement as we approach the first 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration. After four years of anti-environmental policies under the previous administration, I'm so pleased and so energized to see an entire administration committed to combating our climate crisis in an equitable and just way. From day one, President Biden has shown his commitment to work alongside environmental justice communities, his commitment to listen and learn from their lived experiences in order to advance solutions that promote clean air, pure water in an environment free of toxic pollution. As part of his promise to advance environmental justice, the president has directed every agency to develop programs, policies and activities to address the disproportionate health, environmental, economic and uh, climate impacts expressed, experienced by EJ communities. Establish the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council to ensure the administration's work is informed by the expertise and insight of EJ leaders from across the country. Initiated the development of a climate and environmental justice screening tool to identify historically disadvantaged and overburdened communities and inform equitable decision-making across the federal government and created a government-wide Justice 40 initiative, which will ensure the benefits of federal investments are felt in EJ communities. From these actions and more, it is clear to me that the president understands that from now on, our nation's environmental policy must be informed by the awareness of how our laws and federal programs have left EJ communities out and left them behind. Grounded in the guidance and wisdom of EJ communities, I am certain that the Biden administration will work to advance climate policies that address our nation's legacy of environmental racism and build a clean energy economy that works for everyone. 
I'm proud to be their partner in this work. In Congress, my top priority is addressing our climate crisis and working to advance the cause of environmental justice. A central part of my work is the Environmental Justice for All Act. You know, for almost two years, I, alongside uh, the National Natural Resources Chair Raul Grajava and environmental justice communities from across the country uh, worked to introduce this act. It's been crafted by the people, for the people, to give EJ communities a voice and means to fight back against the pollution that threatens their children and their families. You know, together we listened and learned about the impacts of climate change uh, in our nation's policies on communities across this country and built, and built a community-led, community-driven process to address the needs and perspective of EJ communities. Our Environmental Justice for All Act envisions a society where all people are safe from pollution, a society where, where generations can live, work, play, pray, and learn in places that are healthy. To achieve this vision, including the Environmental Justice for All Act, is language to strengthen the Civil Rights Act of 1964 so that citizens can enforce their rights against environmental discrimination. Robust su support for research, community education, and technical assistance to help EJ communities uh, uh, in their quest for health equity and, 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 uh, and to build capacity as a civil rights organization. The requirement for federal agencies provide early and meaningful community involvement opportunities under NEPA when proposing an action that will affect an EJ community. An end to practices of overburdening EJ communities with cumulative impacts and over-concentration of pollution sources in their communities. Mechanisms to avoid, I'm sorry, to aid fossil fuel dependent communities in achieving a just and equitable transition to a cleaner economy and more provisions that recognize the right of all people to pure air, clean water, and all the richness and wonder that this world has to provide. In practice, this legislation will allow private citizens, residents, and organizations to seek access to justice through courts to enforce their Title VII rights in the face of discrimination. Our legislation will require the consideration of cumulative impacts in permitting decisions under the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. This legislation would also establish a federal agency energy transition and economic development assistance fund using revenues from new fees on oil and gas and coal industries to support communities as they transition away from greenhouse gas emitting economies. At its core, the Environmental Justice for All Act ensures that our society be becomes healthy and sustainable, not just for the privileged few, but for everyone. I look forward to working with all of you all to advance this act. I look forward to working with the Biden administration to advance this act. And I just wanna thank you for allowing me to take a part in today's event. I look forward to the great work that we'll do together in the next 100 days of the Biden administration. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Representative McEachin. It is a pleasure to have you in the space with us uh, to continue representing the work that you've poured your life into. We are excited to have you involved in this conversation and so many others. And at this time, we're gonna look to move into our panel discussion. I'm gonna ask the folks who are controlling all the video in the back to change the spotlight. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce each of you to our panel of thought leaders. I will start with their introductions and then we'll go into some brief questions after they uh, um, share a bit of prepared remarks. So our group of panelists are Nicole Sotarman, who is an attorney and policy strategist with a deep background in energy and environmental policy, consumer advocacy, and stakeholder engagement. Nicole has been a champion for local, regional, and national opportunities to integrate clean energy, resourcing, and community-driven solutions for the benefit of low-income families, our planet, and the broader energy grid. If you know what that is, then you already know she's a warrior. 
She's a former senior manager of public policy at Sunrun, the nation's largest residential solar, battery, storage, and energy management services provider. And prior to that, she was assistant people's counsel for the District of Columbia. Now she's the vice president of strategic engagement at Sustainable Capital Advisors, where she heads up the development of partnerships with the private sector, utilities, nonprofits, communities, and government officials. Following that, I'll introduce you to Kareen Taylor, a social justice advocate who has worked tirelessly in the areas of environmental justice, civil rights, and voter protection. She's focused on ensuring that communities of color lead and speak for themselves as we address the important challenges of climate change. Kareen has led the charge on development of deep organizing and capacity building with community with a specific focus on equity and the development of programs and policy. She's a 2020 Catalyst Award winner, and that award provides women leaders of color support and recognition for their commitment to a healthy planet. She began her career at We Act for Environmental Justice before going on to the role of policy director at Green for All, and most recently returned to We Act as the director of federal direct of legislative affairs. Finally, Darnell Grisby, our third panelist, is a national thought leader in transportation policy and the mobility justice movement. He's held, held long and long held expertise on transportation policy, funding, anti-racist initiatives, housing affordability transit oriented development and the intersection of transportation and housing finance. That's everything y'all. Darnell is the former director of policy for the American Public Transportation Association. And he's now the executive director at Transform, a leading advocate for equitable, sustainable transportation and land use policy in California. It is incredible to have the opportunity to sit down with such an incredible group. And I hope that we can set the stage for a great conversation and a town hall and to that end, I will ask each of you two questions following your opening remarks. Nicole, would you like to open up the conversation with a bit about yourself and what you're thinking about? Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, and for the whole team for coordinating this amazing event, I'm honored to be a part of this wonderful conversation. Um, my name is Nicole Cedar-Raman, and I'm a part of the team at Sustainable Capital Advisors, which is a financial advisory firm focused on developing innovative solutions for sustainable infrastructure. I'm also on the advisory committee for Black Owners of Solar Services, BOSS, which is a new collective of Black business owners and professionals in the clean energy industry. So I work at the intersection of clean energy policy, finance, and justice which is why I've been paying close attention to the Biden administration's actions and plans on COVID recovery, climate resilience investments and racial justice. And that means everything from the administration's personnel selections to the infrastructure plan. We are at a place where America's infrastructure, every aspect of it is crumbling and deteriorating. Our families and neighbors have gone through terrible suffering due to the pandemic and communities of color continue to be disproportionately impacted by climate change. So I've been very interested in the actions Biden is taking to center climate and job creation in our COVID recovery and to ensure that our growing clean energy economy is inclusive and facilitates economic justice, building health and wealth in communities of color. I'm encouraged by the Justice 40 initiative, which sets the goal of delivering 40% of overall benefits of federal investments to disadvantaged communities. I will candidly say that uh, I've personally wondered if the 40% is sufficient. Um, and I believe we, has to, we have to focus on um, how the word benefits is going to be defined moving forward so that uh, we can be sure that organizations and businesses run by people of color actually receive direct investment for the communities that they serve. Um, otherwise, we may be in a position where we're seeing a great deal of greenwashing or, or justice washing, if you will, um, of funding going to organizations and companies that have not established firm roots and connection to the communities that need climate resilience resources the most. So thanks so much for inviting me to this conversation. Thank you. Kareen, would you like to take a moment to uh, introduce yourself to folks? Good morning, uh, Kareen Taylor. Really excited to be here with friends, um, people that I admire, people that I, I text and ask for advice for. Um, as mentioned, I am the Director of Federal Legislative Affairs for WE Act for Environmental Justice. WE Act is 
um, a Harlem, North Manhattan based environmental justice organizations, one of the first in the city of New York and one of the first in New York State to really look at how to meaningfully um, engage communities of color and low income communities around the creation of sound environmental health policies and practices. We Act also is um, the only environmental justice organization with a permanent presence in Washington, DC. And as a result of that, um, we have been with um, in so many meetings just with the administration, with, with many uh, congressional offices, with other stakeholders to figure out how we can turn the tide from four years of being completely ignored, from being out on the, um, on the outside looking in at, at an administration that cared nothing about environmental justice to now the Biden administration who's made environmental justice a critical part of their work. And so when we think about what's happening in the, the first 100 days, Justice 40 comes up, the, the the uh, commitment to race, to race and equity, um, climate change and doing so with the lens for community is, is something that's really important to us. We're seeing um, a diversity of not only uh, people of color, but people in thought who genuinely care about communities being appointed, you know, whether it's at the EPA, the Department of Energy, um, throughout all of the agencies. And so there's an excitement and, and an opportunity for a number of us who, again, have been doing this work for years to now really help uh, steer this ship, be, and the ship being our country, steering it to really focus on bringing equity to communities. So when we think about the Justice 40 initiative, when we think about all of the, um, uh, in infrastructure commitments and the commitments within the Biden um, um, the, the Biden uh, budget, there's a really great opportunity for communities. But the reality too, to Nicole's point is a lot of people are clamoring now for this attention that EJ communities have been demanding for years. And so when we say what the Justice 40 should, initiative should be, how do we do that in a way that allows um, those communities to really see the benefits of that. And what will those benefits be? Will it be direct types of investments in communities or will it be um, just programs and, and, and putting money in programs um, that might not necessarily have always benefited for us? So there's a lot of concern, there's a lot of excitement, um, but what is really, I think the, the key focus of all of this is there's a real key opportunity to allow communities of color to be at the table in a real genuine way, whether it's through the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council or um, NEJAC or through a whole host of other um, bodies that are coming up to really help this administration drive in, in environmental justice and equity in a really holistic way. So really excited to be here today. Um, there's a lot of work for us to do, um, a lot of opportunity for groups. And, and frankly, I would hope that some groups that are traditionally always in this space take a step back and say who isn't at the table and how do we get them present? How do we find the resources for them to be present? This is a really... Um, demanding time for EJ. It's like the spotlight is on us. And so how do we do that in a genuine way that isn't uh, taking away from our capacity to really do the work in an authentic way. So thank you for having me and I look forward to more conversations. Thank you, Kareen. Darnell, it's your turn. Uh, as you start with your opening remarks, can you just give us a sense of what your most significant priority is that um, you've seen the administration be responsive to in its first hundred days? Sure. Uh, my name is Darnell Grisby. I'm the executive director of Transform, a nonprofit addressing climate change and racial justice through transportation and housing solutions. I grew up in Southern California in the very type of community most impacted by systemic injustice. Those communities are designed to disempower voices like mine. My family has been impacted for generations by failed and misguided investments in our urban spaces. Those decisions actually cost many American families, economic opportunity, pollute our communities and make housing unaffordable and underfund our transit while forcing us to use streets without trees or adequate shade on a warming planet. My response to growing up this way was to learn how to use political power and good policy to uplift our communities and move people out of poverty. That's why I've worked in public policy and politics my entire career, mostly on public transportation, housing and land use and, to, and, and the intersection between those issues to advance affordable, sustainable housing near transit and jobs to create walkable and healthy communities. Transform does that with a very strong racial justice and climate lens. Given all of that, I'm very excited about Biden's American Jobs Plan. It's a historic investment in a broad definition of infrastructure. That broad definition is actually the best opportunity for our nation to compete 
on the global stage by bringing all of our assets to the table. The health of our people and communities, clean air and clean water, and a livable climate are a critical infrastructure because they promote fairness and entirely new economic growth engine. I'm so excited to see that in the president's plan. Thank you. Thank you, Darnell. Uh, I'm really excited to chat to just jump into this as we open up space for the town hall. I'd like to ask all three of you uh, to give us a sense of what you're looking forward to the administration prioritizing in the next 100 days. We're just at this at this nexus point uh, for the first 100. But what do you need to see happen in order for us to feel like we're at success at day 200. And uh, we'll start with Darnell, since you uh, just uh, briefly wrapped, can you tell us what's the one thing you wanna see the administration focus on in the next 100? Well, I I'm really excited about the American Jobs Plan because I think it's a very powerful anti-racist policy initiative. Throughout the plan, there are proposals to, to undo racist policies of the past and ensure that those who have been most impacted by white supremacy see real benefits. But the anti-racist policy doesn't just impact people of color. Every American would enjoy the benefits of this plan, providing equity and opportunity to those that need it the most and giving our entire nation a boost. So that's very exciting. Uh, particularly, I'm very excited about the idea of including more money for transit than roads and bridges. When you combine the money for passenger rail and public transit, uh, that's more than roads and bridges. And that's huge for our communities because it actually allows us to reduce emissions and air pollution and increase mobility for our people. So those are exciting things and that's what the next couple of days should be focused on. Thank you, super appreciative of you lifting up the fact that racial equity and climate, racial equity and transportation, racial equity and the all of the policy that we're looking at has to have an anti-racist lens. And that's not just focusing on the hard ground, the pavement, the grid, but on what's happening to people. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Nicole, would you like to respond with a um, with a really crisp answer around what you wanna see happen in the next 100 days and why? Sure. Uh, one, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that the American Jobs Plan includes uh, the National uh, Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator or the National Green Bank, that uh, developing a national space where we can leverage public and private dollars uh, for communities of color for the deployment of clean energy resources is going to be really essential. Um, and also, um, I would hope that um, uh, the Biden administration, though, would consider expanding the pie on, on what is currently proposed for the, for the National Green Bank. Uh, the amount, I believe, right now is $27 billion. Would be nice to see that reach the $100 billion mark because we really need to see real, solid, chunky dollars <laughs> being uh, uh, invested in communities of color. Um, that's going to be essential. Another thing that I do want to make sure that I highlight is that voting rights is a climate issue. Um, and I really want to lift up that I live in the city of the District of Columbia, 700,000 plus people do not have the right to vote in Congress. 700,000 plus people who are impacted by climate change, by heat island effect, by rising sea levels, by severe weather events. And we do not have the ability to vote on national um, climate energy legislation of any kind. And that is um, a true violation of civil rights. And that has to be addressed if we're going to be able to, to really move forward um, with climate justice in, in this country. So I'm hearing two things from you uh, in the spirit of, of, um, of one of the greatest films of all time. We'd rather have the kind that folds is what I'm hearing from you about the dollars coming out of this administration to support our community. Yes, I did reference uh, a coming to America. Uh, just also want to lift up the idea that the other thing you talked about is that uh, having the ability to be counted and have your money move through the system without a voice is really important and that we have to balance out the need for a strong democracy to carry us where we're trying to go on climate and move those dollars. Thank you so much, Nicole. Kareen, you have the final word. What are you looking for from the administration in the next 100 days and tell us why? 
Well, of course, you know, we appreciate um, just some of the uh, the starting points around the American Jobs Plan and the budget. But I will say without strong legislation, appropriations and transparency, um, the communities that have long been left behind will further um, be uh, left behind. Even with all of the platitudes around the Justice 40, we need to see those things implemented. Now, when we think about um, this image behind you, we need to address cumulative impacts um, throughout this country, um, not only are we thinking about the climate crisis, but how do we address the legacy pollutions that have existed in communities for generations? How do we do that? Well, one example would be um, Congressman McEachin was just on his Environmental Justice for All Act is a bill that we have supported and will continue to support. The en en Environmental Justice Legacy Pollution Cleanup Act is another bill that we're supporting. So we need to couple these executive um, actions with legislation and then have the money go out and be funneled in a way that can allow for transparency and accountability to ensure that it's implemented in ways that communities can really see the benefits of those. Bless you, Kareen. I heard it here from you first. It is not just about the big ideas and the fantastic plans, but the exciting regulations, statutory responsibility, and the deployment as the dollars hit the ground. I would like to thank you on behalf of everyone who benefits from the work. Uh, as, Dar as Darnell pointed out, it's not just Black people who get saved if we stop doing work that's racist. The whole world gets better. It's time to see more of that. Thank you all for uh, making some time to join us to open up the conversation. Uh, I believe that we are getting ready to take a break and move into questions directly from um, the media. So thank you all for giving us your time before we fall into the town hall. Thank you very much, Kareen, Darnell, and Nicole. For reporters that are joining us, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen so that you can submit your questions to these panelists and for all of our attendees. Uh, anyone else who wants to listen in, you can, but we will uh, invite you to take a stretch break if you, if you so desire before we resume the town hall portion at 11.42. Okay, the first report, the first question that I'm seeing here is, what's the plan for building the movement among everyday people? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Um, who wants to take that or, or start the answer to that question about building the movement for everyday people? Well, in terms of the environmental justice movement, that movement is made up of everyday people who have realized that systemic racism is harming our bodies through the pollution that we've experienced for generations. So I think really the question needs to be, how do we get the moderates and the progressive whites who, who are um, you know, the big owners of the money that moves movements to then start investing in these communities to then have those issues show up more on the ballot or, or funding those organizations to do the work that they need to do. I think the, the everyday people are, we, we care about these issues. We just need to have the support of philanthropy to do the work in, our, in, our, in a way that's effective. Say that, Darnell. Um, I would say we also need to make sure we continue to talk about jobs and the economy and the role that our work plays in actually in advancing people's lifestyles and their ability to feed, to feed their families. Uh, because that's a core area that the right is using to actually impact our work. So we need to make sure we head that off at the past by making sure we do those arguments ourselves about we can actually lower out-of-pocket costs by addressing climate issues. Uh, that's extraordinarily important. Awesome. Let's see. Uh, Nicole, do you want to add anything to that or should we move on to the next question? Oh, happy to move on. They, they answered the question perfectly. Fantastic. Next question. How will you and the folks you serve hold the Biden administration accountable if it doesn't fulfill its obligations to community, including EJ communities. Who wants to take that first? Oh. Um, I'll, I'll the big say, A, <laughs> accountability. Well, I'll, I'll reframe uh, the question a little bit and, and put it this way. Um, when we have allies in power, our job is to make sure they have political cover to make sure they do what we want them to do, what they say they would like to do. Uh, and in the game of politics, we need to make sure that we, we back them up with support. Uh, so that's a form of accountability. If they say they want to do something, we can be there to have their backs and make sure they don't get in political trouble for doing the right thing. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think it's critical 
uh, accountability isn't just kind of a one-time end of the road event. Um, it's an ongoing uh, relationship, um, uh, maintaining close uh, communication with, with the people that we've elected um, and their staff um, um, and providing them with the information, the data, uh, and the arguments that are well supported by substantial research so, so that they can have the firm footing to move forward on, on the specific uh, needs um, that we have to, uh, to, to advance. Um, so just maintaining the very close uh, communication with people um, in power um, and uh, holding their feet to the fire essentially. Fantastic. We have a question from Dean Scott. Besides the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Panel and the existing NEJAC, uh, National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, what are the ways that all voices are being pulled into the administration and Congress, particularly from those that traditionally haven't been members of these groups? I mean, nobody likes a club except the bouncer, right? Unless you're, unless you're inside. So, so how do we make this work accessible to all the folks who have to help us get it done? Any answers from the panel? Well, I would say there are a lot of networks and a lot of, uh, I think, on the ground um, coalitions that have been moving and doing work. Um, the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, the Climate Justice Alliance, the Green New Deal Network. There's so many groups that have uh, a national um, impact, but then local work happening that are and have been, you know, doing this work for some time. And I think in terms of engaging more people, I think it's having uh, the store, the ability to tell our stories in a way that connects the problem to solutions. Typically, um, we, we see people parachuting in with solutions, but if we're empowering communities to say exactly what it is that they need and what those, um, what those investments should look like, that'll kind of, I think, build the steam and then build the encouragement to kind of make these issues that sometimes can be really wonky, um, really personal as it comes to, you know, addressing asthma for a family or hiring and, and, and empowering communities through job creation. So I think if we connect the personal story to these larger issues, a lot of things can keep happening and more people will get involved. I would also add that communities, networks, organizations need resources to stay engaged in uh, these various regulatory proceedings where their voices are, are needed and essential. Um, it takes capacity, it takes funding, it takes time um, to be able to continue to sustain engagement, very essential engagement at the public service commissions, at the, the legislatures, at Congress, at FERC, um, at the EPA. So, you know, the, the shoestring budget, um, those days need to be over and communities need funding and support to be able to effectively be able to communicate consistently um, the asks that they they deserve to present to the people who they've elected. Um, uh, that's a very real issue, funding for advocacy. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, I'll ask one question. So Civilian Climate Corps, everybody seemed to want it and it's happening. How do we make sure that there are any melanated folks there? I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to melanize the, ne the next generation of work if there aren't any people in the ecosystem of opportunity. I hate the word pipelines because, you know, obviously, but what are your thoughts about how do we make sure that there's people who can tan, people who like sand, people who are black inside of this next great idea? Well, we need to look at the historical um, impacts of the Conservation Corps of the New Deal and how that shut out Black people and a lot of women from opportunities and avoid all of those pitfalls. But if there's a prioritization on frontline and EJ community involvement and getting organizations um, like WE Act, um, like a whole host of groups that have been doing this work that have access to membership bases involved in the planning of what this uh, the climate, the, civil, the Civilian Climate Corps looks like, I think we can avoid um, just some of those problems. I, I agree that it needs to be a, a, a pipeline or a, um, a, a place where we can develop more young leadership and, and more young interest in, in not only um, conservation, but really addressing the issues in their community. So the projects need to reflect the issues in those communities and then the people involved in those solutions need to be the people in those communities. So it can't just be about you know um, the forest and, and, and deforestation, that's really important, but how do we address urban heat island effect through those types of programs? How do we address um, uh, uh, indoor air quality or, or um, uh, unhealthy homes and how do we have projects that are specific to those community needs and then have those students and those young people be a part of the solution. 
Thank you. That's a, those are awesome ideas. I think it's really important in the history of um, this legislation and the and the work that is coming out of the American Jobs Plan for this administration to point out that labor has been a real sore spot because black folks and brown folks have not been allowed to move into those spaces. They have not had those opportunities. The GI Bill did not reach us in the same ways. So avoiding that same consequence is a really important thing for each of us. Uh, someone else asked a question anonymously. Uh, folks who are, there are folks who are at the, uh, aren't currently at the table in environmental justice spaces. Uh, do we have any uh, feelings or comments about what specific issues might not be being raised even in the rooms where we have gained some new access as community? I would say a lot of issues are being raised. And for the person asking the question anonymously, if you feel your question or your issues aren't, make yourself known and become a part of an organization or a community group and and be a part of the conversation yourself. I mean, you know, there's so many voices that have been at the table, honestly, in comparison to previous years. But if you feel an, is an issue isn't being addressed, it's not your opportunity to speak up to. I hear that. It feels like we're in a moment where lots of new things are happening, a great many experiments at the same time. It will be premature to judge the outcomes before we have seen uh, the work even really happen. Uh, it's part of why we focus on the second question on what do we wanna see next? Because we are sequencing a lot of change at the same time. I really appreciate each of you for taking a, a moment to lift up all of the things that you need to see happen, uh, what you're expecting from this administration, the ways that that work is nuanced and how much work it's taken to get here. Uh, for our final question, can any of the panelists identify a specific EJ issue that the White House initiative can address? Uh, given the expansiveness of climate in this space, specifically, are there any climate issues or in community engagement issues related to that um, that need to be lifted up in this moment? And what does success look like? It's a big question. So uh, one of the elements of the job plan that I'm really excited about is the uh, $20 billion program to reconnect communities that have been cut off by historic highway investments. Uh, and looking at the background behind you, Tamara, uh, it sort of you know, reemphasizes the importance of that. Uh, California has a similar program that we're trying to push uh, through our own program. And I think that's part of the question too, is how do we make sure that state investments align with what's happening federally? so that we actually are addressing climate and not actually digging a deeper hole with our state and local investments as we take federal dollars. So um, this is a very broad question. Um, and I, I'm gonna respond with um, something that I appreciate happening um, uh, from the Biden administration. Just one, the American jobs plan is sprawling. It, I've heard that <laughs> term used for it. And that's so appropriate. I'm fine with that uh, because of this, this moment in history that, that we are in. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to acknowledge that the Biden administration has, un they understand the principle of personnel is policy. And um, the people who are currently at CEQ, at DOE, at various other agencies, some of whom are participating in this meeting today, um, they get it. They, they get the connection between um, economic justice and climate justice. They understand that climate justice is racial justice. They understand the intersectionality of so many um, issues related to um, racism in this country and, and, and the need to really build a very strong um, cross-cutting foundation so that um, our communities can um, reap the economic health um, benefits of um, our climate resilience transition. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there can be, you know, even more, you know, work around um, figuring out um, how uh, um, businesses uh, owned by folks of color will be able to have a much more uh, greater role in, in the clean energy and uh, clean transportation um, uh, industries as owners, not just as employees, um, but as innovators and, um, and thought leaders. So, and I know that there, there are people in the White House um, who are working on that. I'd, I'd add in, in this um, 
quick mad dash to address carbon emissions that we not lift up um, solutions that are that are really not going to be helpful to communities that in many people many people view them as false solutions whether that's okay. carbon sequestration and um, this hope that investing billions of dollars in those technologies that have been unproven to really address the climate crisis at the um, rate that we need it like prioritizing those will be harmful how do we do um, how do we address the climate crisis and also do it in a way that's pollution free if we how do we prioritize solar and wind and, and battery storage and those types of options without um, impacting the public health of communities that have long been um, kind of holding um, their breath literally as they've been polluted and and science hasn't always responded appropriately so how do we balance that need for climate um, for the climate crisis with environmental justice issues is something I really want to see more discussions around. Fantastic. I have heard some really fantastic answers to this question around what else is next on the list? How are we going to get there? Who needs to be included? It is incredible, uh, Kareen, that you landed on the idea that we cannot confuse the haste with which we must find solutions with grabbing any solutions at any cost, because that's a lot of how we've gotten into the position that we're currently in. Uh, communities that are calling for real solutions often are referring to solutions that are vetted through folks that are already impacted, asking them if they can carry another brick or what other decisions can be made. So it is an incredible, incredible window for us to have this opportunity. The question is, are we doing what we're gonna, are we gonna look back in 2030 and feel like we did everything we could with everyone we could to save everyone we can. Um, I want to send my gratitude to each and all of you. Uh, thank you for giving us this time of yours. Uh, it's really valuable and for helping to spark the conversation. I know it'll only get better as we go on through the town hall, but thank you so much. Uh, we're going to close this section of the panel. Thank you, Kareen, Darnell, and Nicole. And we'll be back for the town hall at 1142, which is right now. <laughs> Thank you all. So welcome back, folks. We haven't gone anywhere. Um, we ran largely uh, on time, which is incredible. I want to take this moment to welcome back folks who were returning, uh, who did not stay for our Q&A section. Our incredible panelists opened up the discussion on issues of transportation, energy, climate, and agriculture. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you back and move into the town hall portion by introducing you to Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali. He is a renowned leader, strategist, policymaker, and so much more. He spent his life fighting for environmental justice, public health, equity, and political empowerment for the most vulnerable in every community. Dr. Ali currently serves as the Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate, and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation. And on the side of everything else, he's trying to save the planet, everybody. It is my great fortune to introduce you to our to moderator for today, Mustafa Santiago Ali. Thank you, Tamara, and, and thank you for this incredible event. I was in the green room, I was getting hyped because I was like, this is just incredible, the conversations that are going on and we're gonna keep it moving. You know, this is a transformational moment. You know, we have the opportunity to actually make sure that folks have the opportunity to move from surviving to thriving, to make sure that those who have often been unseen and unheard no longer have to deal with that dynamic. We have an opportunity to make sure that the 100,000 people who are dying prematurely from air pollution every year that that no longer happens. And we know that as African-American and Latinx brothers and sisters who are the ones who are, unfortunately, the ones who are losing their lives and the ones who are getting sick. We can make sure in this moment, if we do it right, that the 60 million people who dealt with unsafe drinking water over the last decade, that that's no longer in the mix. So I'm incredibly blessed to be here with you and honored to moderate uh, this conversation with such incredible leaders who are focused, who are dedicated, and who also understand the power of policy, because we know policy can either be used to uplift communities or policy can be used to deconstruct and damage communities. So this is going to be an exciting conversation. And I'm incredibly blessed because I also get a chance to talk to some new folks who I've been watching for a while. Uh, so let's just go ahead and jump right into it. We have our brother who's with us here, Jahi Wise is the senior advisor for Climate Policy and Finance in the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy. He previously served as Policy Director for the Coalition for Green Capital, where he helped lead development of policy and strategy to establish a national clean energy accelerator. In his role at the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, he focuses on domestic climate finance, clean energy development, 
economic development and equitable investment. We thank him for being here today. Please welcome Jahi Wise. Uh, brother, can you drop uh, a couple of, uh, couple of minutes of knowledge on everyone? <laughs> thank you, Mustafa. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you uh, as well. Uh, thank you all for convening this amazing town hall. It's, it's, it's really a blessing to be among, among friends, both old and new, um, to have this very important conversation at this moment in the administration. Um, as was said, my name is Jahi Wise. I serve as a senior policy advisor in the Climate Policy Office in the White House. Um, our job is to help coordinate President Biden's whole of government response to the climate crisis um, and its impact on our communities. Um, and uh, I, I can bring greetings from Gina McCarthy, our, our the National Climate Advisor, who's very, very, as you all know, keen on issues of environmental justice um, and equitable investment. Um, I caught some of the last panel um, and, and a few friends on there, I think I would hit on a lot of the same themes. Um, the, the Biden administration came out of the gate um, with our day one EO rolling back harmful um, policies from the last administration with our day seven or eight executive order establishing the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and the White House Envi um, Environmental Justice Interagency Council and the Justice 40 Initiative. And then now with the American Jobs Plan, we are putting uh, dollars on the table um, to direct towards communities um, for all the things that folks in this, on this call and in the stream have been fighting for for years. I'm really excited to have a conversation about um, where we go next. Um, as someone already highlighted, there's a lot of legislative work that needs to be done. I think it's time to get into the details um, and happy to, happy to share about kind of where we're thinking on those points. But it's really a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. It is nice to meet you, Mr. Wise. My name is Bishop Marcia Dinkins. I am the executive director for Black Women Rising and Ohioans for Sustainable Change, which is formerly known as Ohio Interfaith Power and Light. We were not a utility company for all of those who are against fossil fuels, okay? Um, it is so nice to be here and on this panel. Today, I wanna ask, um, Understanding that Black Americans and African American focus organizations have had difficulty with obtaining federal resources, such as PPP loans. How will the administration ensure that the resources in the American Jobs Plan will be equitably distributed amongst Black communities, African American serving organizations, rural communities, in particular Blacks in Appalachia, who continue to be overburdened, exploited, extracted, and excluded from economic opportunities and resources? It's a fantastic question. I appreciate, appreciate you asking. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, uh, a, couple, a, couple, a couple thoughts. Um, one, I think, I think what you're referencing and something that Kareen referenced in the earlier panel is, is the infrastructure of implementation, I think is what we could, what we could describe it as. And so how do we make sure that these plans and proposals actually turn into Turn into real dollars that hit real communities um, and provide real benefits. Um, and I think, you know, the and I know for a fact that that President Biden and the team have been focused on this question since before we we came into office. And that's why in the January 27th executive order, you saw a kind of a few key pieces of infrastructure put into motion. Um, and let me talk for a minute just about those. First is the interagency um, uh, council. And so this is a body that sits in the White House that's populated with the secretaries of, of all the key agencies that make climate investment. And the focus of this, of this interagency council is to identify um, and begin to solve for implementation challenges um, that prevent resources from flowing to environmental justice um, overburdened communities. And so you have, we have the, the kind of brain power, the focus at the, at the right level, thinking about these issues and how do we implement them. We back that up and, and actually one of the pieces that this group is gonna come out with is the environmental justice um, accountability scorecard, which will track where each agency is, is on, the, on, its, um, on its mission of delivering benefits to environmental justice communities. I think second and probably the overarching framework here is the Justice 40 initiative. And so in the American Jobs Plan third paragraph, like 25 page document, third paragraph of the document says 40% of the benefits will flow to these communities. This is a key underpinning of the administration's approach to infrastructure and the administration's approach to governing in this space period. I mean, by setting that as a framework, we're requiring all agencies to think about how we make sure these, these resources flow. Um, I think the third piece I'd highlight is the um, White House Environmental Justice Advisory 
Council. And so as folks are familiar here, there's a NEJAC and for a long time we had environmental justice leadership at the EPA. One of the big pushes that the advocates and folks on this call pushed for was to elevate that into the White House so that they have a role directly into a kind of cross-governmental um, uh, purview to push on issues of environmental justice. And so that's supposed to be the mechanism kind of in and out for a flow of information in from the environmental justice community to say, hey, what we're seeing on the ground and what you're trying to accomplish are not matching up and also policy recommendations. And so, you know, those are a few of the pieces um, that, are, that are kind of in place right now to, to make sure that we're accountable for these resource flows. I just want to underscore as well that, you know, this is a plan and um, we really have to get it to, you know, legislation um, and then the dollars have to flow and then we have to implement. Um, and I think on the implementation side, another thing that, that's really helpful and folks have already begun to do this is to reach out to us and let us know where you're seeing programs that could be tweaked where you're seeing regulatory or statutory or, or just programmatic implementation barriers that prevent things from working the way they should. So we can begin to, begin to take affirmative action on those points. Um, so we're, 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 trying to, we're trying to attack exactly what you're describing and it's, it's a core priority for us. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Wise. Um, <laughs> I'm Marnice Jackson and I am the co-director of the Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition and also a US CAN board member. Um, so it's nice to meet you, and I have a question for you. Um, awesome. Hey, so as mentioned in the last panel, they were talking about direct investments, and I know you just mentioned uh, paragraph three in the Justice 40. So for me, that looks like climate reparations, but mm -hmm. I want to um, know specifically, um, can the sacrifice zones or frontline communities be compensated for their health impacts in the form of home ownership grants, business grants, organizational grants, not loans, something they do not mm. have to take back um, since we're paying with our help. Mm. Yeah, there's a um, there's a lot in there. Thank you for that question. Um, on, on the campaign and in the executive order, uh, the president the president has been clear that communities that have borne the brunt of pollution over the last um, decades should be first in line to see the benefits of this clean energy transformation like that that that's a clear that that's a clear connection here um and the the american jobs plan tries to act on that um by doing exactly what you described building the capacity providing the resources for organizations that are addressing legacy pollution to actually get out and do that work so you'll see in the jobs plan um a commitment to expanding um and increasing the environmental justice grants program um, to enable EJ organizations that are doing the good work on the ground of addressing legacy pollution to provide them with more resources than is currently allocated both as a budget line, but also as, a, um, as, as an amount of funding that's available. Um, there are other places in, in the American Jobs Plan that provide grant, grant, um, grant funding to organizations. On the business side, and I saw Nicole on here and, and I, my, my, the, the folks I love over at BOSS, um, the Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator is one of the objectives of that institution is to become a window of capital for black and brown owned businesses that are doing the hard work of deploying energy assets into, into our communities um, and providing them with the low cost source of capital that they need to build wealth and to share those benefits out. Um, on the housing, I think there's a, there's a lot of very interesting stuff that, that's in the plan on the housing side from the weatherization program, which, you know, which is, and, and, and deepening that to become an electrification program, um, not, just a, not just an energy efficiency program. There's a, a huge historic commitment to doing that work. There's also a commitment to, to, pushing, um, to pushing for legislation in Congress that would allocate resources for increased home ownership, for, for building new homes, for rehabbing existing home and housing stock um, so that families that are, that are currently locked out of the market can have access to it. Um, so there's a lot of different ways we're trying to attack this issue of, of providing those, those resources um, to communities that have, that have borne the brunt of the last era of our, of our, um, of our economy. Well, thank you, Jahi. Thank you, Bishop Marsha Dinkins. And also thank you, my sister, Marnice Jackson, uh, for all that you continue to do uh, and staying focused on the, on the fight ahead. So thank you all so much. We are now going to transition and we're going to start to break down a little bit around agriculture. And we are incredibly blessed that we have Badisha Batacharya, 
uh, who is the senior policy advisor in the Farm Service Agency at the US Department of Agriculture. Previously, she served as a director for climate and energy policy at the Center for American Progress. In her role at FSA, she works to serve all farmers, ranchers, and agricultural partners through the delivery of effective and efficient agricultural programs. We are grateful to have her with us today. Uh, please welcome Vadisha Bhattacharya. And I also want to say for the folks who are going to be asking questions, we're going to ask you to ask all your questions and then uh, allow for the response. Uh, go ahead, uh, Badisha, and, and share with us your two minutes of incredible information that we all want to hear. Thank you so much, Mustafa. And I hope not to take two minutes because I want to listen more than talk. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having me in this incredible conversation. Um, so I serve as a senior advisor um, on climate and environmental issues at USDA. I sit within the Farm Service Agency, which is kind of the delivery arm for a lot of our producer-focused programs, but I also work across the department on some of our cross-cutting climate initiatives and uh, on the environmental justice side as well. So I don't, I don't think it's any secret that USDA hasn't generally been at the center of climate conversations. You know, the focus hasn't... Um, been enough on the reach that the department has and the impact that it can have. Um, and the department has not had a great history when it comes to racial justice. Um, and I think that is something that is front and center in the mind of this administration. So, um, you know, thinking all, all about the historic discrimination that, um, you know, black, brown farmers have had um, from the department, the, the loss of farmland, the heirs property issues that you know, prevented folks from, from benefiting from the broad suite of policies and programs that USDA has to offer, or the way that people have been systematically shut out. These are huge, huge problems that I think we're starting to um, start to think about and address. So um, equity is a central pillar of USDA, Secretary Vilsack and President Biden's thinking on agriculture. Um, the American Rescue Plan had some, some huge historic debt relief provisions in it that we're now figuring out how to move forward on um, to relieve debt for, you know, uh, you know, what are deemed uh, socially disadvantaged producers, which has a very specific meaning in the law. Uh, so I'm going to use that term here, even though I know it's, it's not always uh, the best term to use. Uh, but that's something that we're thinking about in, very carefully on how to roll out. So that there will be information on that forthcoming. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the dialogue and conversation here today on, you know, thinking about climate, climate justice, environmental justice when it comes to lands, um, natural climate solutions, et cetera, um, and the intersectionality of all of this that, you know, you need producers and, you know, stewards of the land from all backgrounds to be part of the solution. And that's kind of where our head is at at USDA. So with that, would love to hear your questions. Thank you so much. Eric, we're going to turn it over to you. Yes, yes. Hey, good morning. It's still a minute left in the morning. And thank you, Miss Batacharia, for joining us. And I'll Feel just free to it. use Badisha. My last name is impossible to pronounce. It's Batacharia. Yeah, I, I gave it my best shot. Thanks for giving me that grace. I'm a small farmer here in Georgia, small African-American farmer. And I'm also a part of a historic African-American cooperative that was founded in 1966. And I just want to ask you this and, and present this to you. Given the fact that the USDA relationship with black farmers has been defined by a history of exclusion from slavery to sharecropping to the modern era of black farmers have faced torture, multi-generational debt servitude and stolen land. And during these same periods, regenerative farming as practiced by George Washington Carver, among others, we also practice that in my co-op, helped save the soil quality of the South after the devastation of the Civil War. From Shirley Sherrod to the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, Black farmers have successfully incorporated collective and cooperative ownership practices in our work to feed our people. Our practices, we feel, are better for the environment and people than corporate-owned factory farms. How, the question to you, is how will the USDA move billions of dollars and provide protections to support existing and would-be Black organic, regenerative, and cooperative farmers particularly Black American farmers whose families descend from U.S. labor and sharecropping. Thank you so much for that question, Eric. And there was a lot packed in it. So um, 
I'm probably not going to be able to satisfactorily answer everything, but I would love for this to be the start of a conversation. Um, first of all, you know, I think recognizing that, you know, the root cause of a lot of this is racism. And so starting with just enabling farmers to be on the land, stay on the land. And so that's kind of where I think just the repairing the damage from the past piece comes in and the, the American Rescue Plan debt relief is just a start of that. Um, but we've got a billion dollars in there too that's forward looking and thinking about answering this exact question. And so right now we're, we're, we're just starting to think about and have conversations with folks like you and others on how can, we, how can those dollars be put to work to um, do a lot of what you're saying, like recognize the leadership and the innovation that's happening um, among uh, black, brown producers um, and ranchers, and how can we elevate some of that? How can we reward it and make it part of the solution on climate? So I wanted to um, say that. And we also have, um, as part of President Biden's climate executive order, USDA is uh, has been told, and we're working very hard right now on hearing from folks on uh, climate smart agriculture and forestry. What does that mean to folks? How can it be made to work as part of the solution on climate? And for 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 this community, how can we make it work to do exactly what you're saying, Eric? Like, look at the expertise that lives within producers like you, um, and how can we design exist? Uh, how can we tweak existing programs to make them work better, target them better, and what are new ideas? What are innovative ideas? So, I'm actually going to put in the chat. We have a we're doing this through um, the Federal Register notice uh, where we're collecting formal comments. If you have a chance to submit your thoughts via that, we would love to see it. Um, there's a deadline that we're under, under the executive order, so we unfortunately can't extend this deadline, but this is not the, the end, it's just the beginning of a conversation. So all of those ideas are most welcome. Um, and uh, just know that this is, the question you're asking is exactly the question we're asking. Um, and I think there's no one, one answer, but I think there's a huge broad suite of tools at USDA. Um, in our existing programs and authorities we have and flexibilities we have. And we're also looking forward to the 2023 Farm Bill for areas where there are places where we can't currently do, uh, make the changes we might wanna see uh, to achieve some of these equity goals, but um, that can, be hap can happen with the help of Congress. And so we would love those ideas as well. So I just put it in the chat um, and someone else did too, thank you. Uh, and uh, so please, um, please give us your ideas. Thank you. Ms. Kathy? We're now gonna to go to Ms. Kathy England. Ms. Uh, Ms. England, you are currently on mute. Good afternoon, my name is Kathy ECJ chair for the NACP National Board of Directors and also with ECHO Mississippi Regional or toxins during the manufacturing process in violation of the Clean Air Act to ship wood pellets to other countries to be burned for energy. How will the administration review and rescind the classification of biomass? as a renewable energy source. The CO2 emissions are not accounted anywhere in this process because of the rules of double counting under the terms consider take pellets production. Additionally, and as much as we have led in cumulative CO2 emissions with the, and adhere to the terms of the Paris Climate Agreement by influencing allies as it relates to climate finance in support of loss and damage. Thank you, Ms. Kathy. You were breaking up for me a little bit. I don't know if that was just on my end, but I've got the question in the chat here, so I think I caught it. Um, so thank you for your question. This is uh, raising an important and complex issue. Um, so, and it's one that we've heard uh, 
from, you know, from other important folks and, you know, stakeholders. And um, so it's one we're thinking about. I don't have a, a, a very satisfactory answer for you right now, other than we're listening. Um, this is one that is complex, as you're likely aware of. Um, you know, we're, we hear both from folks who um, have very legitimate concerns about um, the, the, the impacts of um, air quality and others on health and the disproportionate impacts that it has on communities of color and low-income communities. We also hear from, you know, black landowner groups who want access to these markets. And so there's there's different sides of this coin. Um, and so right now we're listening and we want to continue listening to figure out how to, uh, how to think about this issue. And I also wanna note that on the broader environmental justice issues, uh, this and others, uh, Secretary Vilsat sits on the uh, White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council. And so, uh, you know, and that process is, is just getting up and running. And uh, so this will be among, you know, issues that I think we will also think through uh, that process as well. So I hope that starts to answer your question, um, but I, I hope there is a lot more dialogue to come on this and thinking about how to address some of these issues. So thank you. And thank you, Badisha. And, and also to uh, Eric and Kathy, thank you for those very important questions. We're now going to transition to the third part of our town hall that's focused on EPA, climate, environment, and infrastructure. And I'm blessed to introduce my sister who I've known for a long time, Rosemary Inabakre. Uh, Rosemary is the Associate Administrator for Public Engagement and Environmental Education at the Environmental Protection Agency. She previously served as the Deputy Associate Administrator for Public Engagement and Environmental Education during the Obama administration and was a campaign director at the Clean Water for All campaign. In her role at the EPA, she leads the agency's community outreach and strategic public engagement. We are honored and blessed to have her with us today. Please welcome Rosemary. Thanks so much, Mustafa. So excited to be here uh, with so many wonderful panelists um, and, and folks from uh, some of the folks from the administration. Um, what a time uh, that we are in where you know, EPA is really able to do a lot of the work that it's done um, by itself for such a long time um, by focusing on climate change and really lifting up uh, environmental justice. Uh, I am really excited to, to be at the agency um, at this time under the, under the leadership of Administrator Michael Regan, who is so invested in making sure that we are engaging communities from across the board in a very real way. Um, but also to make sure that the work that we're doing is centered around science and is focused on protecting the health of the public. Um, and so I am just really excited to be here to have this conversation, this important conversation, um, and to really just engage with folks. I think community engagement is, is, is my specialty um, and the thing that I really enjoy doing because it's hard for folks to make decisions um, uh, uh, when, it's, when it's about communities. And so it's a really important to make sure that you have that community input and that dialogue um, in order to be informed, make some of those really tough and, and key and important decisions. And so I'm happy to be here um, and looking forward to taking some questions. All right, um, I believe uh, we're waiting on Tara. So let's go right to Taryn Collins. Uh, Taryn, why don't you go ahead and, and drop that uh, question on, on Rosemary. Great. Um, thank you, Mustafa. And thank you, Rosemary uh, and my Spelman sister for taking the time to uh, answer my question today. I'm Torn Collins. I am currently employed with an international uh, uh, environmental organization. I'm based in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm doing a lot of work around uh, clean transportation and electric vehicles. Um, I'm also an EV advocate uh, and also the owner of an electric vehicle. So this is near and dear to my heart. Um, in my work and in my personal relationships, I've had the opportunity to engage community to gain a better insight about their thoughts around uh, EV adoption and EVs in general. Um, I found that in conversations that there are many questions around um, EV adoption and EVs and that there's sometimes incorrect information about what that entails and as far as like charging and costs and, and whatnot. So, uh, my question to uh, you and the Biden uh, Harris administration is what are you all planning to do to make uh, electric vehicles appeal to um, sometimes the average folks, say like homeowners, um, stay at home dads, uh, local friends and others that are living within um, my community, which is Southwest Florida, uh, just uh, across the 
the uh, U.S. in general. Thank you for your question. And so happy to have a question from my Spellman sister. Uh, the Spellman love runs so deep and so really excited to, to engage with you today. Um, uh, on the electric vehicles part um, uh, and regarding EPA, so we don't pick one vehicle over another. Um, we set the tailpipe standards for and, and automakers meet them. And so that said, you know, automakers, automakers themselves are always looking ahead and many of them have um, have been looking at and making some, some products uh, uh, for the future um, that really lean in on electric vehicles and really offer more um, around electric, electric vehicles for the everyday family. Um, and it's not just folks who have exotic names. We're also talking about um, companies like Ford and, and General Motors. Um, but as technology improves and the ranges improve and increase, um, these will be some really extremely um, valid options and, uh, for, and, and very family-friendly options for folks who are looking to, to have electric vehicles. One of the things that I'll say is that families really care about a couple of things when, when, we talk, when we're talking about cars. They care about reliability, durability, um, cost of ownership and maintenance, um, convenience, so charging at home and also being able to charge at work. Um, environmental impact, so zero tailpipe emissions, um, and room for people and their stuff. And so electric vehicles um, will check a lot of the boxes for some of the busy families. Um, uh, electric vehicles will also um, provide range for folks um, uh, as far as like their typical daily use. Uh, families drive on average about 50 miles per day. And so uh, the majority of households are traveling under 100 miles a day. And so models, uh, electric vehicle models now um, go well beyond 100 miles uh, on a fully charged battery. And so that, this is a really good and safe choice for a lot of the, the families to be able to, to own. And so, so many of the companies are looking forward to being able to put these electric vehicles in reach for folks. But again, I think it's really important to lean in on the things that people are looking for and, and companies and, and, and other folks are definitely paying attention and hearing them. And so, you know, we're really excited about electric vehicles and just the possibilities and the, and the, the, the work that needs to be done ahead. Fantastic. Um, we will also have uh, Tara Huska who is joining us and we have a question from her. Um, so I'll do my best uh, to actually uh, sort of put a synopsis on it. Rosemary, you know, uh, when it comes to rural issues and on indigenous lands, there are a lot of water issues that are going on. Uh, and of course the permits that are associated with that. Uh, what's the vision there at EPA for being able to better address the needs that are happening in our rural and indigenous communities around water issues? And I, Absolutely. I'll, I'll, and you I know, can water issues, uh -oh, sorry. No, no. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. I just want to add on behalf of my two-spirit sister in this work against pipelines to just say, what are we going to do about line three? Because I don't want to represent her if we're not going to go all the way there. Thank you. Totally. Thank you for that. Look, EPA wants to, well, one, let me take a step back um, and, and kind of address uh, Tamara's comment. One, I am thankful for the advocacy um, that Tara and, and other folks uh, have um, and that they're doing. This is advocacy is really important. And that's the background that I come from. And so it's really important for folks to hold us accountable. So thank them um, and thank Tara for, for laying her life on the line every day to fight for what she believes in. And again, holding us accountable. Um, and so, you know, for us, I think it's really important for us to hear from communities. Again, I think that's really important. And that's what my day job is, is to be able to hear and understand what the issues are in communities so we as an agency can make informed decisions around protecting public health. Um, and so we want to be able to have conversations with indigenous communities. We want to be able to have conversations with, you know, underserved and overburdened communities to really be able to lean in and address these issues. Environmental justice has, is, is at the forefront of our work. Um, and we are really looking to, to make sure that that work is spread across the agency. And water is no different. I come from a, I come from a water background. I ran a, a campaign focused on water. And so I know how critical it is and I know how important it is. And I know the things that we need to be having in place to address some of these most pressing issues. So look, I think it's a really important for us to have a dialogue and a conversation. And I would love to meet one-on-one -on -one with Tara or meet with the group 
um, that she's organizing with to have a conversation about what EPA and what the broader admission administration can be doing in order to be able to address some of these issues and protect public health. All right, well, Rosemary, uh, Tara in spirit and Torren, thank you so much uh, for this particular session that we just finished up. Thank you so much. Thanks. Let's move on. Uh, we are now incredibly blessed once again uh, because I get the opportunity to in, uh, introduce my sister, a powerful sister, uh, Shalanda Baker from the Department of Energy. She is the Deputy Director of Energy Justice and Secretary's Advisor on Equity at the Department of Energy. She was most uh, recently a Professor of Law, Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. And she was also the co-founder and co-director of the Initiative for Energy Justice which provides technical law and policy support to communities on the front lines of climate change. In her role at the Department of Energy, she leads the energy justice and ensures that its policies, proposals, and initiatives are grounded in equity. We are lucky to have her today. Please welcome Shalanda Baker. Oh, thank you so much, Mustafa. It is wonderful to be here. And I'm so excited to see Reverend Malcolm and Chandra Farley so uh, very excited to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Well, let's just go ahead and jump right into it then. Uh, Reverend Malcolm, why don't you go ahead and hit us with that first important question? Thank you so very much. Uh, greetings, I'm Reverend Michael Malcolm. Reverend, you are currently muted. I'm so sorry. I'm Reverend Michael Malcolm. I am the founder and Executive Director of the People's Justice Council, as well as Executive Director of Alabama Interfaith Power and Life. We're based out of Birmingham, Alabama, and I want to say thank you for the opportunity to present at this town hall. Uh, thank you to Tamara, uh, USKN, and the many others that have made this happen for us. Thank you and congratulations to my twin, I, and I call you Dr. Dr. Shalanda Baker for being one of our communities first. Uh, Dr. Baker, you know how I feel about you and you know I'm lo so looking forward to our conversation when we premiere Let's Talk with Rare on Earth Day. Our mission at the PJC is to engage and equip communities with access and tools to build power from the grassroots up, to fight for justice at the policy level. One of, one of the ways that we are doing this is through the We Rise program, uh, weatherizing every resident in the Southeast, where we are engaging communities of faith to implement uh, community-led solutions through weatherization as an outreach uh, ministry for their most vulnerable in their communities. As I've told you in our conversations before, it's my job to make uh, weatherization just as sexy as we've made food pantries. Um, that being said, we faced a lot of unnatural disasters due to this climate crisis. Being that we've had a weakened um, electric grid, as well as we've all, we're have we already, prior to the unnatural disasters, experiencing excessive energy burdens. How do we now look at investment from the administration? What avenues will you set up for these investments? How do we deal with the supply chain so that our communities that are feeling the effects and are overburdened, find some sense of relief now in this new administration. Not necessarily the benefits, but the actual investments. Given the weatherization program, how do we scale that up so that our communities benefit from the investments in that program? Wow, so I love the question and you know, thank you so much for just being such a great thought partner um, for, for a while you know, for me in this work. I wanna just again, thank the organizers for having me be a part of this. Um, I've been a long admirer of your work, Mustafa, as well as yours, Tamara, 
And, um, you know, I'm excited to just be in this conversation. I want to lead by saying that um, equity is the North Star for Secretary Granholm. And she is committed to ensuring that equity is a part of this energy transition and that all the infrastructure that is promised is equitably distributed and that the burdens themselves are not disproportionately falling on certain communities. And so for me, um, I am watching that, right? I am tracking that. And, um, you know, my work has been in the realm of energy justice for the last decade, and I'm really interested um, in making sure that the benefits and burdens of this transition are equitably shared. Um, so I think one of the, your question actually for me raises a comment that um, Nathaniel Smith, I know who someone you know well, and Sandra, you know well, uh, made last week um, in a conversation with me. And he said, Shalanda, tell me what happens when you throw good money into a bad system. And I think that's really at the core of what you're saying. So we know that energy burden um, has disproportionately affected communities of color. And that's the overall amount that people are paying for energy needs in this country. Um, in your communities, the communities that you care about, Reverend, um, we're looking at 20 percent or more of overall income just to make sure that people have safe homes. Um, energy and security is something that plagues black and brown communities. 50% of homes are doing the things that you and I have talked about, those coping strategies like using an oven to warm the home or using an open flame to stay warm at night, you know, things that I grew up with. Um, and so um, these are problems that need to be remedied. But if we simply poured money onto the existing system, we know that we'd get a bad result. And so I'm very concerned um, with interrogating the ways in which we have rolled out programs like the Weatherization Assistance Program. We know that it has not reached the communities who need it the most. So I'm interested in, in working with you know, our, our various stakeholders within DOE to sort of really pull back the curtain and say, look, how are we doing this? And, and what, what needs to change to make sure that we get resources um, where they are needed? We have great partners who have been a part of the DOE community for years, um, and they have done great work. But again, to reach the types of communities that you and I um, have been looking at and thinking about for a long time, we, we need to bring different types of stakeholders into that conversation. And so that means that states then need to be, um, you know, required to partner with, with different types of partners in the rollout of weatherization uh, assistance and other assistance that we know is coming. Um, again, we're sort of needing to turn to the existing infrastructure of advocacy. I mean, the, the EJ movement, the climate justice movement is ready um, to be activated in this infrastructure package. They're, they're excited to be activated and be co-creators co and co-participants in this transition. And so we've got to look to those leaders um, to do things completely differently, right? Um, because I would hate and I, and I will not allow uh, for good money to be brought into a bad system. And so I'm, I'm really interested in interrogating the structural aspects of our system to ensure that we do right by the taxpayers um, as we go into this energy transition. So I love the question. I know where it's coming from. And I'm absolutely committed to, to keeping my eye um, on the structural pieces. So thank you so much. Chandra. Well, good afternoon. It's so great to see you, Shalanda. I'm glad to be here. Um, this is a wonderful conversation so far today. My name is Chandra Farley. I am the Just Energy Director at Partnership for Southern Equity based in Atlanta, Georgia. We're a racial equity organization working across Georgia and the American South. Uh, we know that despite bearing an inequitable proportion of the negative impacts due to climate change and carbon-based energy production, that marginalized communities are virtually unrepresented in the energy planning and decision-making processes that drive all the inequitable outcomes that we have been talking about today um, in energy regulation, distribution, and policy. Um, so our work at PSC is really about engaging our just energy ecosystem of partners across the South to get involved in those regulatory arenas and be involved in the full spectrum of decision-making. So what kinds of resources and infrastructure can the administration provide to ensure that enough capacity exists within these local community-based organizations, within local governments and these 
grassroots organizations to ensure an equitable allocation and distribution of the resources that we know are gonna flow from the federal government, particularly through new initiatives like Justice 40 and traditional programs like Rev talked about, weatherization um, and efficiency programs. Well, Chandra, you know, this question is near and dear to my heart, right? I've spent the last um, better part of a decade trying to create mechanisms and pathways for frontline leaders and experts to have a seat at the table in terms of policy making and ensure that their voices were heard um, by regulators, by legislators who are building the infrastructure of the future. And, and that is largely happening outside of you. And so, and I know that you've been involved in a lot of those regulatory proceedings and other, um, you know, high stakes matters that a lot of people just aren't tracking right now. Um, I, I want to give a little bit of a frame for my work, um, which I think will inform the answer to your question. And so the broader frame for my work is uh, energy justice. And so energy justice uh, requires a few different things. It requires procedural justice, which speaks directly to your question, that's having a meaningful seat at the table. And those from the EJ world are well aware of procedural justice, right? Not Nothing for us without us, right? Um, the second piece is um, distributive justice. So that's ensuring the goods and bads of a system are equitably distributed. And we know communities have not been um, on the good end of, 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 the, of um, any infrastructure to date. The third um, component that I think we need to acknowledge is recognition justice. So that means that we need to recognize the unique lived experiences of people as they're at the table. Um, you know, what burdens are they coming with that we can help unload through policy? And then the last component, which a lot of people don't talk about, is restorative justice. And restorative justice for me is the healing potential of this system. I fundamentally believe that we can heal our communities through energy policy. And the, the bow to wrap it all up is centering frontline communities in our policymaking process. And so for me, it is absolutely essential to engage often, to engage deeply and meaningfully and not make it a one-time um, engagement with frontline leaders. Just last week, the Secretary of Energy invited a group of frontline environmental justice, climate justice leaders to that table with her to talk about some of their top policy concerns. Um, and for me, it's, it's let's drop right into the, the weeds, right? Let's drop right into policy. Um, so I think the more mechanisms that we have for that so that the federal government is not a mystery because by the way, you pay my salary. By the way, you know what I mean? I'm not sort of existing on my own in some private world. Um, I am accountable to the people who put me here. And I want to just put even a finer point on it. I'm accountable to all of you in this, in this Zoom room right now. I mean, the advocacy of the environmental justice movement and the environmental movement created the space for something like a deputy director for energy justice. And so you better believe that I, I remain accountable to that movement. I stand on its shoulders and I will be going back to the movement in my work. And, and I know it won't be easy, um, but that's my commitment. All right, well, thank you for some real talk. I told y'all y'all was gonna get some real talk with Shalonda Baker with uh, Let's Talk with Rev Michael Malcolm and also with Chandra Farley, incredible. Uh, I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali, and I'm now going to pass the mic back to my sister. Thank you so much, Mustafa. I want to thank you in front of everybody for all that you have given to this work, including this time on such a busy day. It has been a pleasure to watch you move through this space and take and pick up so many of our friends and family along the way. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, thank you to the representatives from the administration that have come and a special thanks to every single community member. It is my pleasure to begin to wind down this uh, moment, this town hall, but I wanna send a couple more thanks out into the world. I wanna thank each and every panelist in today's town hall for taking the time to lift up the work of the first 100 days of the administration and amplify our shared expectations for the next. I'd like to thank Green 2.0 and it's ED Andres Jimenez, Adrian Alasea, Xiao Zong, Marquea Thomas, Olivia Freeman, Ishmael Buckner, and the whole crew at US Climate Action Network, Paige Knappenberger of Climate Nexus and the National Black Environmental Justice Network for its support. I also want to thank you again, Mustafa, and every attendee for joining. Thank you. It's time for care and repair, and this is how we do it. Thank you all.